Um, hi, everybody. I'm super excited uh, to be here. Um, I know a few people messaged me saying hi, so um, and that they were excited to come. So thank you so much for coming. Um, really pumped to talk about some lean synthesis. Um, I feel like it's like all the buzzwords at once. Um, so in this talk today, what we're going to cover is first, what is synthesis and analysis? Because that's always a good starting point. Um, how to streamline your synthesis. Uh, some ways to avoid confirmation bias and kind of like how to create on the go insights. Um, so um, I might be switching my screens back and forth a little bit. Uh, so just bear with me here as I do that. Um, but I also want to show you all um, some of the things that I'm talking about as I talk through them. So um, as Renee mentioned, I'm Mickey. Uh, most importantly, that's Poncho. Um, and as she said, I've been a user researcher for quite some time. I think it's actually like nine years now. Uh, so it's getting getting up there uh, in those, those years. Um, I love Pokemon and World of Warcraft. Huge fan of Pokemon. I have them like hanging everywhere, like photos of Pokemon in the house, uh, as Curtis knows. Um, I write psychological thrillers uh, in my spare time. Uh, just because it's cool. Uh, and then some of my favorite sports are tennis, archery, and fencing. So like archery and fencing, I guess, are like old school <laughs> in a way. Uh, tennis, not so much. Um, but yeah, and then as Renee mentioned, um, we live on a small island off the coast of France. It's called Jersey. It's part of the UK. Um, Google Jersey cows. They are so super cute. Whoever said that they, their, their favorite food would be cow maybe might rethink that after seeing the Jersey Cows. No, I'm just kidding, because I love it too. Um, okay, so cool. Um, in the chat, because uh, I like to start with something engaging, um, can you write how you feel? How do you feel about synthesis? Uh, and since I'm a researcher, I'm all about the feels. Uh, I love hearing about people's feelings. Uh, so um, I would love to hear how you feel about synthesis. Uh, and maybe you can find some uh, commonalities in between you and other people um, so that you can synthesize your own comments. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get started. As I mentioned, uh, we are gonna start with kind of understanding what synthesis and analysis is. So how I define synthesis and analysis is making sense of user research by bringing it together and finding common patterns and trends across the research. And the whole point of synthesis is that it enables a team to take action, right? So if we have a bunch of data, so let's say we have like seven, 10, 12, 15 qualitative interviews, if you dump that on a team, <laughs> they're not really going to be able to do much with it. So the entire point of synthesis is creating like these small insights, which we'll get to later, that help people make decisions, help people figure out how to improve products, they help innovation, right? So they help us know what to create next. Um, so again, it all goes back to enabling a team to take action. The only problem is, is in our ideal world, we spend, should, the should, should spend double the amount of time of a session on synthesis. So a one hour interview means that you should be doing two hours of synthesis. So if we took a generative research um, study, which is typically speaking around 12 to 15 interviews, one hour interviews, you're looking at 24 to 30 hours of synthesis. And there's a lot of steps involved, right? So we have a lot of different steps that go into this ideal synthesis process. And that does not make it feel lean in the slightest, which is why it is tempting to say the least to skip synthesis. But what happens if we do that? So if we decide to skip synthesis and we just do the interviews, um, what can happen is that information, and I'm speaking as a researcher who has done hundreds and hundreds of interviews before, that information can become very muddled in my brain. And sometimes, especially if you're juggling multiple studies at once, some studies kind of like merge into other studies. And then you're like, was that from this prototype or that prototype? So it can lead to really unclear results. It's also, if we skip synthesis, you're highly likely um, to be under the influence of confirmation bias, uh, which is when you pick out things that you wanted to hear that confirm your hypotheses uh, and that feel good. And you ignore all the other crappy stuff that's actually quite helpful in improving your product. And again, looking at like 
just even like five interviews, there can be a lack of action if you skip synthesis because you're kind of just sitting there like, okay, like what do we hear from these five people? Um, and like, oh, we don't want to synthesize. Let's just move forward, right? You pick out those things that you did hear that might not have actually been consistent across um, your participants, which means you can build the wrong thing and ignore research. And to be completely honest, and this might be a little bit harsh, but if you sk skip synthesis, I would question why do the research, right? Um, so the synthesis part is the, that <laughs> I hate this phrase of actionable insights, but it is the thing that puts research into action, right? So what I want to do is I want to strip down those like 24 to 30 hours of uh, synthesis time that I know nobody wants to spend, um, except for me, maybe. I love synthesis. So, um, <laughs> um, but I, I want to uh, introduce something called lightning synthesis to you. <clears throat> And the benefits of doing lightning synthesis is that although it's less time, you spend less time doing synthesis, you still are able to understand the problem rather than going off like your confirmation bias, even if it's unconscious uh, and you're not meaning to do that. Um, you, you look at the problem rather than your assumptions. Um, and what's really great about lightning synthesis is you can pull other people into this process which means that you're collaborating and communicating them with them on the go. Again, which also means that you're sharing this knowledge much more efficiently than if you were to wait after like seven sessions, do the synthesis at the end alone potentially because nobody else wants to join your like full day workshop of synthesis and then you have to share it back. So if you do this lightning synthesis with a team of people, what happens is you share knowledge on the go, um, which makes it a lot easier at the end of the study to like dive right into the action. And finally, gaining buy-in from, from others. Like, I don't know if you've ever tried to explain how great something is, kind of like what I'm doing right now, instead of showing people. Um, but if you include them in this like short synthesis session, um, what can happen um, is it's easier for them to feel the impact and, and see the benefits of it if they're part of it. So um, including people in these short little um, synthesis rounds um, can help you gain buy-in uh, for either more research or for more synthesis. Um, so there are quite a few benefits um, to this lightning synthesis. And then as well, um, what you can do with it and what I have used lightning synthesis in the past, and I have used it as a, like a full-blown user researcher, like I have used this before uh, because I've, I've also been very time poor. Um, and, and so what can happen um, is you, you might not need to create a formal report. So what I did is I did lightning synthesis on a Miro board, and I'm going to show you my template in just one second so I can explain a little bit more what that looks like. But I ended up presenting insights directly from that board. So like we, we synthesized as we went, and then at the end, I was able to just like go right in and just present from there because everybody had already been a part of it. Um, so I didn't have to spend time on a report. And then with this particular type of synthesis, you 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 highlight things that are helpful for your team, helpful in, help, in making, making better decisions. So like pain points, needs, and quick fixes. And these things create a sense of action and urgency, which leads to the next steps. Um, so those are all the like benefits and kind of, you can avoid certain things that tend to take a lot of time. I know report writing can take a lot of time. Uh, I know getting from like the synthesis to the action can can take some time as people have to digest information, but lightning synthesis can kind of speed up that process and make it more um, efficient. So, what is lightning synthesis when we when we look at it? And I know that there are like quite a few steps here, but I promise that there are fewer steps than in that slide before, which had like. I don't know, 10 or 11 steps. Um, so I have tried to half it <laughs> um, as best as I can. Uh, the reason that I'm saying you don't ever have to do synthesis is because it is necessary. Um, so, um, but I am trying my best to help you understand how to kind of lean that out. And the first thing that we start with is gathering, gathering all your data. And that can take several forms. So it can be notes from a research session. Um, it's best if it's like session recordings or transcripts. Um, when you when you gather all these notes, um, it's it's super helpful um, in having them to refer back to during the lightning synthesis. 
And, and just a tip that I have, if you're using a software um, or some sort of um, recording device that allows you to timestamp uh, recordings, do that for like highlight reels or quotes. Um, it makes it easier to pull them out later. Um, and what I mean by highlight reels are like little clips that you can create um, that show people, generally speaking, having a really hard time doing something. Uh, so rage clicking uh, is a great highlight reel um, or, you know, people failing to complete a task. Um, so if you mark down timestamps um, on, on those recordings, uh, it can also make it more efficient for you when you're pulling out additional data. And then we are gonna create global tags. Um, so uh, tags are the things that help us organize the data. Um, if we just looked at all of those notes as they were, um, they might be a little bit scary. <laughs> um, and so um, global tags um, are the first step to creating your lightning synthesis section. A session. Um, and first, I'm just going to do a quick uh, why should you tag um, a slide because it's important to, to talk through this. Um, tagging brings order to chaos, uh, right? So when you choose uh, to, to kind of organize and synthesize and structure your data, the best way to do that is by using tags, right? Um, because again, that helps show concrete evidence of pain points, needs, and quick fixes. Um, and it inspires action um, and helps you identify bigger trends. So if you say that something is a pain point, right, and you hear that same pain point over and over again, you can start to say, hey, that, that's a trend in our data, right? Um, and the, the tags that I'm going to share with you um, are the ones that I use specifically for lightning synthesis. Um, and I will explain um, again um, in, in just a minute what that looks like and, and how we bring this all together. Um, the cool thing about global tags is you can use them across all your projects, so you don't need to think about new tags and new tagging taxonomies after every project um, or for every project. What you can do is use these lean global tags across all of your projects, so it makes it a little bit easier for you. So these are the lean global tags that I tend to use. I pick four at a time. Um, I added on five because I thought maybe that would be interesting for you um, just to have a, a, an extra one in case you wanted to focus on something else. Um, but these are the most lean, uh, most common lean global tags that I use. Um, so when we look at these, a goal is something that somebody is trying to accomplish. Um, so as a goal, I want to run a 5K, right? So that's my goal. My goal is to run a 5K by like the end of... Uh, I don't know, the summer, <laughs> give myself a lot of time. Um, a need is something that I need to fulfill a goal, uh, right? So I need shoes, I need running shoes to get me through these horrendous runs. Um, I might need a water bottle, you know, I might need a training program. So these are all the things that I need to accomplish a goal. And a pain point is a barrier or something that's difficult um, and it does not, it's like an obstacle for me trying to accomplish this goal. So a pain point could be something like, I can't run <laughs> without losing my breath um, or I get like uh, muscle cramps or I get, uh, you know, blisters and like um, or I don't know how like should I run in intervals or not. Right. Um, and then a tool is something that people can use to try and accomplish a goal. So this could be anything from like a physical um, object. So like shoes are, are technically a tool that we use, um, but it could be digital as well. Um, so like uh, Couch to 5K is like a super popular app that teaches you literally how to get off your couch and train for a 5K. Um, but always keep in mind that tools don't always have to be digital. You could be looking at a pen and paper um, as a way. Um, uh, actually, when I used to go to the gym and do bodybuilding, I used pen and paper uh, to track my progress. Uh, so tools aren't always digital. Keep that in mind. And then finally, a quick fix is something that's painful or annoying for people that can easily be fixed within the context, generally speaking, of a product or your product. Um, this um, uh, dovetail, uh, the dovetail team is going to make um, a small um, kind of like handout for you uh, with these lean global tags. So you can look forward to that um, as well. Um, cool. So what do we do with these global tags? Why am I lecturing you on these uh, horrendously awful things? Um, so what happens um, is you tag each session, ideally right after. And this is where we dive into what a lightning session actually looks like, right? So as a user researcher, um, what I do is when I invite stakeholders to research, um, I add on 20 to 30 minutes after a session. Um, and so this is baked into the calendar invite. Um, so let's say we have an hour session, I invite them for an hour and a half calendar block. 
Um, and so what we do is right after that session, we take 20 to 30 minutes to tag the session, to synthesize the session in a very efficient way, right? So this is where lightning synthesis kind of comes into play right after the session. Um, and I, I do stress that it is really important to do this right after the session, um, because that is when the information is super fresh for you. Um, and you can like really get it done really quickly. Trust me. I have done it where I've tried it to do it the next day. I've tried to do it at the end of the day, which it's just a nightmare. Um, so, um, always try and take the 20 to 30 minutes after the session to do this. So, um, how to run a lightning, uh, synthesis session. Um, you create a board or you can use my template, which you will get, um, access to. Um, and I'm just going to pop in here because this makes it a lot easier for me to explain, uh, rather than telling you, uh, what, what this is. So if you see this board, um, and again, you will get access to this as a resource. Um, if you see this lightning synthesis board, uh, you'll see that I picked four quadrants over here and these, um, I directly line up with the global tags that I was thinking about. So we have, I picked goals, pain points, needs, and quick fixes, right? And so um, within this time, within this 20 to 30 minute window, after the session, we go to this board and we're like, okay, for each quadrant, we're going to spend a few minutes. It's both divergent and convergent work, which is fantastic for synthesis. Divergent being things that you do on your own and convergent being like discussions that you come together and discuss something. So for a few minutes, Everybody writes down on their own all the goals that they can think about from that uh, session. <clears throat> then the next few minutes, you discuss the goals and you cluster the similar ones that came up. Then you move on to pain points and you do the same thing. Needs, the same thing. Quick fixes, the same thing. Right? So what you're doing is after each session, you're getting down the most important information right away. Okay? And the reason that this is so efficient is when you wait after seven sessions, that's if you do the synthesis right after the seventh session, you might have a really great memory of the sixth and the seventh session, but then like the fifth, fourth, th third, second and first kind of all like mush into each other. Um, and, and it's harder for you to like pick out information. Um, so what this does is this, this allows you like a really fresh take on, on the, um, on the session, um, and gets all that information out. So you do this for each participant. And you'll see here that I also have an area for insights. I also have an area for assumptions and biases. And I also have an area for action items. I will talk about insights and biases in just one moment. But I just want to um, highlight this action items area. It's super important because what you can do is right, dur like right after that synthesis um, session, the lightning synthesis within it, you can start to assign actions and, and come up with some things that you can do. Um, so that's what I'm trying to stress is like be as action oriented as possible. Okay. Uh, I am going to dive back in, uh, to, uh, this. So great. And, um, this is a sample agenda, but again, you will get the resources, um, and, um, you will, you will be able to, um, see the actual template. So as I mentioned, um, lightning synthesis is all about efficiency. So it allows you to pull patterns really quickly and write insights as you go. So, um, and, and everybody's like, what's a pattern? Uh, I always think of a pattern as like a trend of three or more people. So if like three or more people like said the same thing. So, uh, let's take that running example. Um, so let's say, um, three or more people were like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't even know where to get started. Right. That, that becomes a trend when you start to hear that uh, or a pattern or a trend. They're very interchangeable when you start to hear that from three or more people. So that's why this like lightning synthesis is so great because like after like, uh, as I'm going to say, after just three participants, you can start seeing patterns and creating insights. Um, and just before we get into writing insights really quickly, um, I just wanted to find what an insight is because I feel like this is like full of buzzwords today, like synthesis, analysis, lean, insight. Um, an insight is something that um, makes us go like, oh, wow, like Owen Wilson. Wow, wow, wow. Um, that, that's like an insight, right? Um, and it pushes us to challenge something that we previously believed or it like disproves something that we believed. Right. So it's something that is like really surprising. Um, and that's like, oh, wow, I, I had no idea that that's how somebody thought. Of course, like insights can validate our hypotheses. Um, but generally speaking, like insights are, are really like about the underlying motivations behind why people are thinking or feeling or saying what they are. So 
how do you create these insights on the go, right? So as I mentioned, um, you can start creating these insights um, as like as you go through these like lightning synthesis sessions. So I just want to quickly talk about the three components and like in all of my other slides and like presentations and articles, like there are like six or seven components of an insight. So I'm also trying to lean out insights for you um, into three different steps and three different components. So a key learning. So that's what the like attitude or behavior is that you kind of learned uh, or the problem. Um, the why. So why people are feeling or thinking a certain thing or why people are encountering this problem. And then the consequence. This is the most important thing. And I see like researchers forgetting about the consequence all the time. Uh, the consequence is like the so what. Like, what's the impact of this um, of this insight? So, for instance, let's say that I was using the Couch to 5K program for training for a, for a marathon, uh, a 5K. <laughs> um, so, in that, like, let's say that, like, between week three and four, like, there's, like, a major jump, right? So, like, I go from, like, running and walking, and suddenly I'm, like, running a lot more, and I'm feeling very, like, un like it's, it's kind of, like, shattered my confidence. I'm, like, oh, I'm clearly not doing something right. I'm feeling really bad about this. A lot of people will like leave the insight there. Like they'll be like, oh, the jump between week three or four, or three and four was like really tough for the user, right? But what's the next step? Okay, like what's the, so what? You know, what, what does that mean? What could that lead to? And generally speaking, it's like, what happens if you don't act on this insight? Like what happens for the participant, your organization, your product, right? So if I'm feeling a lack of confidence in myself, what might happen Especially if you don't say to me in the beginning, uh, a lot of people experience difficulty between week three and four, you know, like if you don't say anything like that in your product, what could happen is I could actually go and be like, this is a frustrating experience. I'm going to go to a different training program. So that is the consequence, right? So it's not just that the user is frustrated and feeling like less confident. Um, they could leave the product, right? So I just wanted to say that really, really quickly um, in terms of insights. Um, and then right before I get to confirmation bias. And that's the last part, I promise. I'm almost done. Um, so what happens is when, you, when you're when you going through that board, um, when, when you're creating these insights, um, I usually start to create insights after the third interview. Um, so let's say that I'm interviewing seven people. Um, I will start to uh, create insights after the third person because I start identifying patterns. Uh, so again, if three or more people are saying that same thing, week three to four is a really big jump. I don't really have any confidence anymore. That then becomes our pattern and we can write that as a, as an insight, right? After the third participant. So once you start seeing those patterns on the go, you can start writing these insights as you go. And, and by the end, you'll have like a load of really awesome insights. Um, and, and you won't have to do like a super long synthesis session at the end. Um, so this is, again, this is really about increasing your efficiency uh, in terms of like gathering that data, tagging that data, seeing those patterns early on, and then being able to write insights like as you're going through the data. So you might have quite a few, let's say you're interviewing 12 people, you might have quite a few insights even by the time you get to like the sixth or seventh person. Um, so that's really, really cool. And then you can build on those insights further if you hear more people saying it. So I just want to say, if you're doing this synthesis, um, any kind of synthesis, but this kind of synthesis because it's more quick, be careful of confirmation bias. And as I mentioned, this is like choosing, like you're, you, we generally speaking unconsciously do it. I've done it before, but we're picking out things that we want to hear, uh, like, oh, that validates our hypothesis. Um, or like, oh, they said that they loved this. And we can kind of like ignore, um, some of the more important feedback. Um, and what that can do is that can lead to really poor decision making. Um, so instead of listening to like what actually went wrong, um, so that you can fix the user experience or that you can create better features, um, you're kind of like, oh, this person loved this. Uh, and then you're like continuing to create something that's like based off of that, which like one person loved and nobody else did. Um, so it just leads to poor decision, decision making. Um, so as I mentioned on that lightning synthesis board, I have like an assumptions and biases section. Um, and in that, so at, before each session, I just like brain dump some like assumptions or biases I might have about the session coming up. And that just gets it out of your brain. So you don't need to worry about it. And, and while you're synthesizing, you can be like, are we, are we like using confirmation bias here? Like, are we, are we like playing up our assumptions? Cause they're right on the board with you. 
Um, you can also include others like uh, synthesizing in a vacuum on your own. It has to happen sometimes, but including others um, helps um, helps them review your insights, review what you're saying, and maybe challenge them, right? Um, so those are some really great ways that you can kind of like avoid confirmation bias. If you are doing it on your own and you don't have a chance to like bring anybody else in, which you can do, you can do this whole process on your own. Just assess the risk if you are wrong. So assess the risk if you are using confirmation bias or like falling into that kind of pattern or falling into your assumptions and biases. Um, and, and what I mean by assess the risk is like, really like take your, take your findings, like the information that you put into those little quadrants and say, look at your assumptions and say, hey, is there anything that's going on between the two, you know? Um, so instead of 24 to 30 hours, and I did the math, um, it's six to seven hours. So I didn't erase synthesis for you, uh, but what I did is I greatly reduced the amount of effort and time that you need to put into your synthesis if you do this on the go. So after every session, you're tagging the session, um, you are starting to write insights after the third person and you're really going, going, going so that at the end, you've already done the work. It's like the opposite of delayed gratification. Uh, it's like really being on top of it. And, and I promise like it might seem like, oh, like an extra 20 to 30 minutes. That's so annoying. But trust me, if you're sifting through like even just seven sessions, it's going to take you a really long time because you're going to have to remember things. You're going to have to go through things again. And instead, what you're doing is you're really just like downloading the information right away so that it is accessible to you, accessible to others and inspiring people to take action. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I hope that that was helpful um, for at least some of you. Um, there are a bunch of ways that you can reach out to me uh, and connect with me. Um, and I, I would love to um, hear about how this goes um, for you. As I mentioned, you're going to get a bunch of these resources. I have a bunch here uh, for you. Um, so you're going to get a bunch of these resources um, after the after this talk. Um, and I hope that they are helpful for you in really getting you started and, and kind of helping you with um, with um, making your synthesis more efficient. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Nikki, for that. I think it's a, a nice lead in and it's always nice to uh, to, to balance uh, user research and product management. So hopefully I can give you a different uh, side of this now. So today I wanna to talk to you a little bit more about getting more from user research for time for product managers. And I can uh, fully empathize with this because I spent a lot of my career feeling like a time for product manager. Um, before we go into it, I wanna tell you a little bit about me. Um, so I love board games, running and rugby. Um, I've got two cats and a dog. And I think some of you saw my cats uh, uh, appear on the camera during Nikki's presentation. And uh, as we said at the opening of this, any dish from my perspective with fried halloumi is going to be a winner. Uh, and then at the bottom are some of the companies I've worked with in the past. Um, before we go in as well, just on Delivery Hero, because a lot of people haven't heard of Delivery Hero per se. Um, it's a portfolio company and it operates different local brands all around the world. So the brands you may have heard of, it's uh, Payer, eFood, Talabat, Food Panda, uh, to, name, to name but a few. So um, today, uh, to talk to you a little bit more about uh, our agenda, I want to talk a little bit about lean in the context of user research, really to kind of kind of build on that that lightning synthesis concept that Nikki was talking about. Um, some of the most overlooked opportunities I have tended to find as a as a product manager of what I've I've done, um, and also what um, I see in our community uh, of an overlooked opportunity. Uh, and then I want to also give you kind of uh, four methodologies that I've done to try and get a little bit more leanness in in the way that we've done user research in the past. Some will work, some some won't, but hopefully it'll just give you uh, some things you can add to your toolbox. So um, I kind of want to title this first section, setting ourselves up for success. Um, and what do I mean by that? And I think the first thing to say here is like we hear often hear about like lead and lean discovery and lean delivery. Uh, and I think often we translate lean to meaning lightweight, um, something I can do quick and easily. And sometimes it is, sometimes that is part of it. But I also think um, that this definition and full disclosure, I stole this definition from Marty Kagan, um, but lean is fundamentally about tack tackling risks early, um, designing collaboratively and not sequentially. And I'll explain more about why I think that's so important in, in a moment uh, and then just solving problems and not just shipping features. So I just want to keep that idea of you know lean not just being lightweight, but having a, a kind of a more overarching vision behind it as, as we go through this. So I've always thought of product development as about building the right things fast. Now, I feel like that's one of those things, it's a very simple statement which masks a lot of complexity, right? 
how do you decide what are the right things uh, and how do we move fast against them as a, as a product development team? And for me, this has always been kind of the, the key question, right? You can optimize um, for, let's say, speed or quality. And how do we as a product development team, how do we optimize for both? And I think one of the most overlooked things, and I say this as someone that was guilty of this for a large part of my career, um, one of the most overlooked things is not involving um, enough of the team in the process of discovery. Um, and I will, I'm going to go out there and say you'll be leaner as a team if you involve everyone in the discovery process. And I want to talk a little bit more about why, uh, why that was my key learning, kind of like the, the, the moments that I've had that have kind of got me to this conclusion. So the headline of this talk was kind of you're getting more from user research for time poor product managers. And then my question, I guess, to us is like, why are we time poor? What is it about the way that we're working that makes us feel time poor and that we have to look for the lightweight opportunities and those, those quick responsive to things? And generally, in my experience, it's because we built ourselves into a bottleneck situation. Um, often with a focal point for the team um, and, and it feels like lots of things have to travel through us for you know, our input, our guy, advice, or in, in some cases our approval. And sometimes that's okay. Like sometimes it's absolutely a part of our job. I'm not trying to say that teams shouldn't have product managers or product owners, but often I think we over-index. And a lot of the community, a lot, sorry, a lot of the, the conversation in the community and historically has been about, you know, protect the team, you know, defend, you know, protect their capacity, protect their focus. And I think it's true and it, and it comes from a good place. But what I think is lots of the times that we over-index too far and what we go, we go from protecting the team and, you know, protecting their, their ability to focus to siloing the team and keeping them away from the, the context of why we're building things and, and what we're building them for. Um, and then the, the problem with the product manager bottleneck is ultimately it's gonna slow down the team's pace of delivery of value. And I'll explain a little bit more about why I think that's the case in a moment. Um, fundamentally, it undermines the autonomy of the team. Um, I would tend to find that most of the colleagues that I work with, be they developers, be they analysts, be designers, be they quick QA, be they my business partners, they're not just there to build the things we tell them or do the analysis. Like they're very clever individuals and have a stake and interest in what we're doing uh, and giving them the context, particularly, um, to help make informed decisions, both in terms of what we build and how we build it. I think that's really key. I think the product, the product manager bottleneck is a really undermining factor to that. And so this is a, a visual that you may have seen before. Um, it comes by John Cutler, who I'm a huge fan of, um, and, and the Amplitude organization. And he has this visualization of the product development process. And he kind of simplifies it quite a lot and says, listen, it goes all the way through from opportunity selection through to you know, running the thing in, in production. Uh, and he says, you know, there's this evolution over time. And uh, the more cross-functional, the more collaborative your workflow is, the healthy you become until hopefully we reach that um, the ideal state of, of, of a product team. Yeah, fully cross-functional. We start work and finish work together uh, and we reduce those number of handoffs. And um, this is this is a thing that comes up in, in, in quite a few kind of areas. And it's something I've seen in, in, in the reality situation is like every single one of those handovers becomes a pain point for you or the team. And I think when we hand over anything, every time we do that, we lose some part of context. We lose some part of the clarity. And, and kind of tying this back to user research, user research is in, in, in various guys is about understanding the context of a problem or the context of a solution, right? And every time that we filter that out or it passes through another handoff, we lose some of that context and it diminishes at each step. Okay, uh, and I think this on the on the right, this uh, I found this video on LinkedIn the other day, and I thought it was absolutely incredible. And like I've seen this happen, right? We go through different phrases, like we expect the user research to go away and, and get this in, insights, and they do, they do a synthesis and hand it over to the product manager. The product manager again then obviously misses a lot of the context, passes it over to the developers, and like what we end up shipping because we just we're just doing handover between groups of humans, we lose that context. And I tend to find that the the more you can do to shorten that, the better. I think the other example, if you ever as a kid play this game of telephone where someone will tell you something and then they have to tell the next person and after five or six loops, you find out what, you know, what message is there. It's going to be very different. And I think it's the same in product development. Every step in the process, every time you're taking one step away from the context of what you're trying to solve for, makes it really hard to understand that problem. If you don't understand the problem properly, it's really hard to solve into that problem. So what I want to say here is I think your value as a product manager 
comes from acting as a knowledge facilitator, not as a knowledge controller. And I, I don't think people do this maliciously. That's certainly not my belief behind this. Um, but sometimes as product managers, we like to solve problems. And I saw this comment come up in the chat a few times, like how do you stop product managers jumping you know, straight to the solution or trying to solve every problem? I was like, you don't need to. And this, this can take us a time. It takes us time to kind of get comfortable with this. But really, your job is to create an environment where your team can solve every problem. And that really comes down to context um, and sharing this context. So going back to this and kind of what John Cutler was talking about here was by bringing those humans in your team and outside of your team, to be fair, into the process, you're reducing these number of gray arrows, these external handoffs or even to fair, internal handoffs, which all, also introduce this level of friction. But the more you can get everybody in the same page, the more autonomous that they can be, right? And there's another great Marty Kagan quote. If you're just using your engineers to code, you're only getting about half their value. I think this is just as true when we talk about our analytics colleagues, our QA colleagues, our business partners, right? Our stakeholders, if you want to call them that. Um, I tend to find that the more you can bring these humans together in a cohesive nature, that's what a really cross-functional and collaborative team should be. It's not just about having all the humans in terms of all the skills, but it's also about making sure all those skills have the context of the business or customer problems that we're trying to solve. Um, so the product bottleneck, the ideal situation is you want to make sure that your teams have the context by which to make good decisions. Um, so your teams can respond to obstacles, questions, blockers without your input necessarily. And I've seen this a few times Like we, we tried really hard at HelloFresh um, to do this where our, the those in our team that wanted to be involved in the, the, the context and the user research. Sorry, the cats are yeah, moving. Oh dear. Sorry about that. Um, who wanted to be involved in this process could do. And we actually had a very high level engagement. There were some engineers that were like, nope, I just want to code, I want to build some awesome technology. That's fine. But we found that the majority of our colleagues in engineering, design, uh, and our business partners wanted to be involved in this. Uh, and I remember a certain situation that came out of this. And so we did continuous discovery in various guises, and then we had different things going on at the same time. And uh, it came to one day and this uh, designer and a, and a front end developer said, hey, we remember from some research a while ago that you know, we, we struggle with customers in terms of how they perceive the pricing of HelloFresh, that people will cancel and sell a discount on their account. So we've decided to, we want to do this experiment around how we communicate discount pricing um, related to a, a different product we were working on at the same time. So we, we had the core designs and they iterated them on the fly to support this. And to me, if we hadn't involved all these humans in all the different types of research, they would, we wouldn't have had those building blocks. They wouldn't be able to make those connected tissues to operate autonomously. So when I when I go back to the idea of why are we time star PM, it's because people feel that we need to be there to approve because they don't have the context. They don't, they don't have enough information to make a decision. And generally speaking, connecting this back to user research, that is so key for, for building that up. So that's my main thing to you. And these are just some pictures of like workshops that we've done. This was from a lunch, listen and learn. Um, so this was to do with listening to customer cancellation calls at HelloFresh. And so we go through, we'd be doing and kind of a little bit uh, to I think as well. So what came up in some of the chats there was like, we were, as we went through the calls, we would take posting notes and then we would do groupings after every several calls. And in this room, you've got some backend developers, web developers, product analysts, business partners, or stakeholders, product managers from different teams to try and help us with our own team biases. Um, and we've, we did this time and time again in different contexts. Again, these were all kind of lightning synthesis. But what that meant was every single member of that product team, and I'm saying product team here is a collection of all the humans, not just people with product in that title, um, they had the context for the problems they were solving. Um, so with that more conceptual starting point, um, which I hope was, was interesting, I want to give you um, some tips for your toolbox and four things that I've always found really helpful in a way of just being a bit, going back to the lean comment, in terms of just being lightweight, that helps us de-risk in a little bit and move collaborat collaboratively. Here are some of kind of my four favorite ones that we, we can do. Okay, so this one is a little bit more heavier. I will, I will admit this is, I start with the heaviest one first, um, but this is a fascinating approach. So, so what the store, which basically you give your live product to your customer and you let them walk you through typically how you use it. Um, it's very generative, very open. You're not necessarily asking to do task completion or measure or anything like that, but you just want to see and hear about how your customers talk about your the product. Um, one of the best things I ever did for this was make sure that the engineers were there. And I remember in one, the customer stumbled across a bug um, and the, the, the product designer who was conducting the, the interview at the time was like, oh, sorry about that. 
they refreshed it and it all went went normal. But the, one of the develop one of the front end developers was in that call, and I looked over. He was he was taking notes, and he switched over and actually started fixing the bug because he never he didn't, he didn't hadn't seen that context, and he built a lot more empathy with the users. So just seeing customers and how they use the product again, we're we're closing the number of um, number of jumps between the the problem space and the context and what they're doing. And I thought that was just a great moment. Um, also, I think I think it was Sebastian in the chat that was talking about this in terms of while you're going through these kind of interviews or whatever um, about making notes live. We would do that often in a Google document. We'd have two or three of us going. We'd have a primary note taker who was actually good at it, and then we'd be adding our thoughts as we went along. It wasn't necessarily tagging, but it was definitely adding thoughts in a collaborative way. Um, the second one, um, everyone kind of likes the idea of this at service level and is kind of terrified it terrified about it. Um, but this was something they did at Stripe for a lot of their early years in the organizations. So all new joiners were required to spend time doing customer support tickets or, or working. So they understood their product and they understood the challenges that their that their users were facing. And I think Stripe is an incredibly user-centric com uh, company. Taking the time with your team to go away and do customer support tickets will generally build a high degree of empathy with your colleagues in customer support very, very quickly. Um, but it also helps you as a team get closer. And I think I remember for a long time, we always used to have these reports on ticket volume, ticket volume for different you know, contact reasons. Those contact reasons have a lot more uh, color to them, shall we say, once you've handled the ticket yourself. You know, 10% of customers are canceling because they couldn't manage their subscription or couldn't, when you actually talk to customers, and going back to Nikki's uh, point, you, you pick out a lot more patterns. I think it's a degree of empathy there. I'm not saying that you then immediately build a product, pro you, you handle five tickets and you solve those five problems. I'm not saying that. You just have to go away as a, a group debrief and bring those insights together. But again, it builds a lot of empathy and you can do that. And you're probably thinking, well, how does how how is handling customer support tickets lean? And again, it, it comes back to this fundamental principle. It's like, how can you share as much context as possible with your team? How do you shorten those feedback loops between where the problem space is with your users, with your customers, with your business, uh, and, and to the teams that will be able to solve it? So if you're spending less time having to explain this again and again, or represent it or rework because you've not solved the problem, that in itself is a, a more lean model to approach these. Um, this one is uh, my favorite. For me, it was always phone my mum, uh, particularly when I was at HelloFresh, because my mum was a HelloFresh user. Um, and I would speak to people who use the product, and I would send them prototypes and mock-ups, and you get fascinating insights. My, my favorite one I ever had from my mum was she, I sent her the, sent her the, 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 the mock-up, and she asked me a question. She was like, but I don't, I don't understand what that letter Q is for. I was like, what, what do you mean the letter Q? What are you going about? And what she was talking about, she was talking about the search icon. And it was a search icon that I'm pretty sure everyone in this call can identify the search icon as being a circle with a line in it, right? As it's meant to mean a magnifying glass. My mom thought it was the letter Q. Now, I'm not saying again that every customer would then fall into that trap, but it was it, it was an interesting way to do a little more kind of guerrilla type research. So if you're, you know, if you're on a smaller team or you don't have dedicated user researchers, you can do these small, more informal things. You need to be conscious that they are informal. And you know, if you've not got a wonderful user research that's help, able there to help you, much like with quantitative data, uh, you can go wrong if you don't know how to use it. With qualitative data, you can as well. But again, this is about building up context and trying to kind of compress those feedback loops that you have as a, as a product team. And then this is my my one of my favorite ones. Um, Nikki touched on this a little bit. She talked about the, having these shorter clips. Um, you can do this, you know, if you don't, if all of your team don't want to necessarily come and do synthesis um, as a way to kind of build empathy and shorten those feedback loops. You take those key clips, either from session replays or from user interviews, and you play them back. You watch them as a team. You you know get some drinks, some beers, or whatever if if you want to popcorn, and then you can do live synthesis and live analysis, live analysis together again. You can compress a lot of the noise. So if you've got an interview that takes an hour, for example, you can pull out some key things that people are saying and you can see with your team what you could do to respond to that and how you can move forward. And again, here, the the, the tagging model that, that Nikki um, explained earlier on in, in the session was also a really great me mechanic for this. So I think they're my kind of my four, two of my more favorite, like leaner methods that you can do to do a little bit more uh, like research, but I think if there's one thing you take away from this, I think involving your colleagues a lot more, so you are a lot less of a time staff PM because you can delegate. You can delegate these out. Your team, your team is able to operate 
autonomously without you and you're able to kind of cut out some of those noise or those middle meetings it's probably the biggest thing I can I can advise and I said I know for me it was a big enabler in my career being able to move faster as a team and as a product manager and it's also bonus tip for those of you in products and looking to progress in your career um learning those skills early will will lend you very well when you're doing the same kind of job in a product leadership role so that's my tip to you um, thank you. Um, feel free to correct on LinkedIn if you want to geek out about talking about product stuff. I'm always happy to chat. Um, I also write very occasionally on Medium and post even less occasionally uh, on, on Twitter. So yeah, I'll leave you with that. If you're only using your engineers to code, you're only getting about half their value. <laughs>